North America's wilderness is home to pristine nature, breathtaking vistas, and some of the most chilling and bizarre missing person cases known to man. People have always feared being alone and lost in the world, but a series of unexplained disappearances in national parks and forests makes that fear all too real. Number 5. Andrew Bliss, a 23-year-old, 6'2 tall man with brown hair and brown eyes, lived in the small town of Pulaski, New York until June of 2003. One day that month, Bliss abruptly left town in his gray 2001 Chevrolet Impala. His friends and family, concerned that they were unable to contact him, filed a missing person report on June 23rd to the New York State Police at the Troop D Pulaski Station. In their report, they noted that Bliss had recently quit his job in the aftermath of a bad breakup. What can't be explained is where Bliss ended up next and how he disappeared. Three days before the missing person report was filed in the upstate New York, deputies at the Sawyer County Sheriff's Department in northern Wisconsin received a strange phone call about an abandoned vehicle parked on Federal Forest Road 162, two miles north of State Highway 70. When deputies arrived to investigate, they found a gray 2001 Chevrolet Impala with New York plates, totally abandoned. It was registered to Andrew Robert Bliss. The circumstances surrounding the discovery of Bliss's car are bizarre. Deputies discovered the vehicle with its doors open, the keys in the ignition, and the gas tank totally empty. No clues were found either in or around the car. Even more perplexing is that the local drivers reported that they saw Bliss walking along the road, and as they passed, he smiled and waved at them. At approximately 8 a.m., a half mile up Federal Forest Road 162 from Bliss's abandoned vehicle, the driver of a logging truck saw him walking. According to the driver, Bliss was wearing a long sleeve shirt and pants, and that he turned to wave. This is the last time that anyone laid eyes on him. As soon as emergency services realized that the abandoned Impala belonged to a missing person, they started an extensive search and rescue operation in an effort to find Bliss. This would prove to be a challenge, however, because the area along Federal Forest Road 162 is heavily wooded with dense brush. The Sawyer County Sheriff's Department, Sawyer County Fire Association, two planes from the Civil Air Patrol, and three canine dogs spent two days searching for Bliss in an eight-mile section of the National Forest. The Sawyer County Gazette describes this area as desolate and swampy. Even with these extensive resources, the search came up empty. Officials also searched any nearby cabins, but they found nothing out of the ordinary. Investigators later discovered that Bliss had run out of gas two other times on his cross-country journey making contact with law enforcement in each instance. Because they didn't find it in the car, police believe Bliss had his cell phone on him at the time that he disappeared. Why he drove to a remote county in rural Wisconsin and why he didn't call the police for help remains a complete mystery. However, Bliss's loved ones and the local community weren't ready to give up yet. In response to the shocking disappearance, people from the area formed the Sawyer County Search and Rescue Team. This team is composed of both adult and youth volunteers, and the initial 21 members completed extensive training, including tracking, clue awareness, navigation, first aid, and other skills. The team resumed the search for Andrew Bliss, even using the search as an opportunity to train new members. This led to the first and only potential clue. In another canvas of the eight-mile section of the forest where Bliss disappeared, Volunteers found a disturbing piece of evidence. Cadaver dogs had alerted searchers to the presence of human remains in a specific area. With each volunteer spaced out 10 feet apart, the team combed through the underbrush for any sign of Andrew Bliss. Eventually, they discovered a bone at the base of a tree beneath its leaves. This sparked renewed interest in the case from local media, as newspapers speculated that this could be the key to finally understanding what happened. The search and rescue team sent their finding to a forensic anthropologist, leaving the Sawyer County community in suspense for days. However, the trail went cold again when the results came back. Experts believed that the remains were nothing more than the tibia bone from a bear, which looks similar to a human's. With no more leads to go on, outdoorsmen in Sawyer County are on the lookout for evidence that could help solve the disappearance of Andrew Bliss. 
In 2011, the Sawyer County Sheriff's Office began asking deer hunters to keep an eye out for any clues that they may find in the wilderness. Pat Sanchez, the Sawyer County Emergency Management Director, told papers, we want to bring closure for his family, and we believe someone may have seen something or stumbled across something, clothing, glasses, bone fragments, something. Anything found in that area could be relevant to this case. If anybody has any information even remotely connected to the case, they're urged to contact the Sawyer County Sheriff's Department at 715-634-4858 or send a tip to New York State Police Troop D at 315-298-1444. Number 4 Towering over the prairies of Montana, the Crazy Mountains are a 35 by 15 mile mountain range separated from the Rockies. This island of mountains is home to massive peaks and dramatic valleys. More than 25 of its mountains reach above 10,000 feet and 40 beautiful lakes are spread out between them. Filled with steep slopes and jagged rocks, this is the terrain of mountain goats and elk. Where there are animals, there are hunters. In 2014, a 38-year-old experienced bow hunter named Aaron Hedges journeyed into the crazies with two friends. The group was on an elk hunt and it wasn't the first time in the area. The previous year, they had established a camp nearby. After setting out from the Cottonwood Lake Trailhead on the west side of the mountains, the group established a camp and Hedges continued north on the trail to gather a cache of supplies that they'd left at nearby Sunlight Lake the previous year. While he was searching for their old camp, Hedges contacted his partners via radio to tell them that he'd missed his turn. His friends told him that he needed to come back up the trail and return to their camp, but that was the last contact they ever had. While walking down the trail, Aaron Hedges suddenly disappeared. For unknown reasons, the other hunters in the group took several days to report Hedges as missing. Police have not released the identities of the other members of the hunting party, but some knowledgeable bow hunters have claimed that they took an odd amount of time to make the report. While Aaron Hedges disappeared on September 7, 2014, the police were not made aware until his wife Christine filed a missing person report on September 10th apparently after hearing the news from one of the Hedges hunting partners. As soon as conditions allowed, the search team began an exhaustive search of the Crazy Mountains. The effort included 20 dog teams, 59 ground searchers, helicopters carrying spotlights and night vision optics, as well as a technical high elevation team. They searched for 12 days but found nothing. Later that fall, however, searchers discovered a pair of boots, a water backpack, and evidence of a fire on the eastern side of the mountains. This discovery was puzzling for two reasons. First, the area around the abandoned camp was covered with sharp, jagged rocks. In order to leave his boots behind, Hedges would have needed to have a backup pair in his backpack. Second, these supplies were found on the east side of the Crazy Mountains, and Hedges had gone missing on the west. Traveling over the arduous terrain between the western and eastern sides of the mountains would be a difficult task for the most experienced hikers. In July of the following year, an unlikely investigator made the next big breakthrough in the case. A butcher named Roger Bislanowicz from the town of Powell, Wyoming, was visiting his family at their ranch on the east side of the Crazy Mountains. One day, he gave his son-in-law a ride into the mountains to repair a fence. When they arrived, Bislanowicz's son-in-law told him that there was a great view if he climbed up to a ridge above. When he did, Bezlanowicz noticed something far more surprising. Resting against a tree, he saw a hunter orange vest as well as a backpack, a bow, and other clothing. At first, Bezlanowicz assumed that an out-of-state hunter just got cold, gave up, and left. As he gathered the items to bring them in, not knowing about the recent disappearance, he saw the hunting license attached to the gear, that of Aaron Hedges from Bozeman, Montana. When they got back to the house, Bezlanowicz jokingly asked his son-in-law whether any hunters had gone missing recently. He simply stared and nodded in response. The site where Bezlanowicz found Hedges' belongings was on private property, miles away from the area that Hedges could legally hunt. What's even more strange is that it was roughly six miles away from where searchers found Hedges' boots that previous year. In response to the discovery, the Sweetgrass County Sheriff's Office investigated and set up a grid search of the area, but again, they found nothing. Finally, in 2016, 
Searchers found human remains that, using dental records, were verified to be those of Aaron Hedges. Only a half mile from the location where Bezlanowicz found Hedges' bow, his remains were barely outside of the search area from the previous summer. While the disappearance of Aaron Hedges was, in a way, solved by the discovery of his body, many unsettling questions remain. What caused Hedges to suddenly veer off course, even before the bad weather set in? Why did Hedges' hunting partners wait three days to report his disappearance? And why did Hedges abandon his boots? The most confusing detail of all is that he ended up 15 miles away from where he was last seen, meaning that he would have to trek across jagged and treacherous terrain in bad weather. As an experienced bow hunter who's familiar with the terrain, it's unknown how Hedges became so tragically lost. Number 3 On Friday, April 23rd, 2021, officials from the Shenandoah National Park in Virginia announced that they were conducting a search for a young man. 18-year-old Ty Sauer had disappeared into the forest the night before. Unfortunately, in the days leading up to his disappearance, Ty had started acting strangely. According to his mother, Chandra Maxwell, he'd been suffering from hallucinations. At one point, he had texted his mother asking her why she sent aliens to visit him at his job as a shelf stalker. He also claimed to have been speaking with his grandfather, a man who had been dead for five years. When Chandra texted Ty one morning to remind him that he had track practice after school that day, Ty responded saying that he was already at practice. Chandra and Ty's father, John Sauer, were becoming increasingly worried, even fearing that he was under the influence of drugs. One day, John found Ty unresponsive in their living room where he'd been watching cartoons. When paramedics arrived on the scene, Ty suffered a seizure. Once Ty arrived at the hospital, it took eight staff members to physically restrain him while they tried to get him to a stable condition and run a drug panel. When the drug test came back clean, Chandra and John hoped that the hospital would admit their son and try to figure out what was causing his hallucinations and erratic behavior. Instead, the hospital discharged him. Chandra and John wanted to get Ty the help that he needed and tried to keep him at home in the meantime. However, Ty stole the keys to Chandra's car while she was in the shower. He took off wearing a blue hoodie, blue pajamas, and white sneakers that were still wrapped in the yellow booties from the hospital. Once she realized that her son was gone, Chandra called Ty to ask where he went, and he answered that he'd just gone out to a convenience store. When he never returned, she knew something had gone terribly wrong. Chandra and John had an app that allowed them to track Ty's location in real time, and they set out after him. Their son led them through Philadelphia and Maryland, and they almost caught him near the White House in Washington, D.C. However, when they hit the town of Lorry, Virginia, Ty lost his cell service and his parents lost the ability to track him. When Chandra saw a sign for the Shenandoah National Park, she decided on instinct that they should head there to find their son. Skyline Drive, a 105-mile road that runs along the crest of the Blue Ridge Mountains, is the only public road that goes through the park. Skyline Drive is measured from mile marker 0 at the north end to mile marker 105 at the south end, and mile marker 51 is Big Meadows, the park's most populous area. Ty's parents caught up to him at a scenic overlook near mile marker 35 shortly before midnight. Why he led them there is still unknown. Nobody from the family had ever been there before. When Chandra and John found Ty, he was sitting in his car with the windows locked and the engine idling, listening to music. While they begged him to come out of the car, Ty sat with a blank stare, unresponsive. In a moment of desperation, John began to pound his fists on the rear windows, trying to break the glass and get to his son. Then Ty turned the key to the ignition as if he didn't understand that the car was already on. He threw the car into reverse and quickly backed out, nearly running over his father in the process. Ty sped around a curve, leading Chandra and John to follow. When they got to him, they found the car crashed into a low brick wall on the other side of the road with the airbags deployed. While the horn blared ominously, Ty got out of the car and disappeared into the darkness of the forest. John shined his flashlight along the tree line, but saw nothing indicating where Ty might have gone. The temperature was below freezing, and this was the last time anyone saw him alive. A rescue effort was coordinated under the joint command of the Shenandoah National Park and the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. A wide variety of organizations joined in the search, 
including the Virginia State Police, three local sheriff's offices, and more than a dozen other search and rescue organizations. At one point, 68 searchers, four dog teams, and a helicopter with infrared sensors were in the field. Volunteers came from as far away as Michigan. However, the terrain proved challenging for the searchers. Steep slopes were covered in tree roots and rocks, with a thick canopy blocking views from above. Shenandoah National Park also has a formal search system, so to protect the safety of volunteers. Only official personnel were allowed in the main search area, and this frustrated Chandra and John, who wanted as many people working on the case as possible. Everyone knew that they had a limited time to find Ty alive. Eventually, a rescue team discovered a string of Ty's belongings laid out in a straight line roughly two miles from where he had crashed the car. They found his blue hoodie spread on the ground, then his pajama pants and left sneaker, and then his right sneaker lodged in a tree trunk. Finally, they found Ty's cell phone with a cracked screen and a dead battery. The location of Ty's items bewildered searchers and experts. It appeared Ty had taken the path of most resistance, heading straight through the dense brush rather than walking along trails and streams. On April 25th, park officials announced that after days of searching, they had found the remains which they believed belonged to Ty Sauer and sent them to the office of the medical examiner in Manassas, Virginia for confirmation. The cause of death was reported to be both hypothermia and blunt force injuries. The cause of Ty's strange behavior and hallucinations may never be revealed. The family believes one cause may have been a medication that Ty was taking for acne. When Ty started taking the medication, he had to sign a waiver saying that he understood that some patients taking the drug had experienced severe mental problems. However, lawyers for the family claimed that it would be nearly impossible to prove the medication was linked to his hallucinations. Number 2 Bart Schleyer was raised from an early age to be a smart, successful, and purposeful outdoorsman. He was seemingly obsessed with the outdoors and with wildlife from birth. His father, a physician in Cheyenne, Wyoming, taught him to hunt at an early age. At just 10 years old, Schleyer's father took him on a safari to Mozambique, where he showed him that the outdoors isn't just about the thrill of the hunt. It's about enjoying being in the wild and truly appreciating the land and animals. This experience changed him forever. Schleyer's resume as an outdoorsman became more impressive with each year. His experiences led him to work for government agencies such as the Grizzly Bear Recovery Project in Yellowstone National Park. In 1983, officials at Yellowstone formed the Grizzly Bear Committee to encourage the repopulation of the species within Yellowstone, and they brought in Schleyer as a bear expert. He lived in the mountains for months at a time, researching how bears reacted when hikers encroached on their territory. As part of his search, Schleyer would personally approach bears to trigger a reaction, often having to turn and run up a tree to escape. His co-workers fondly remember how much he loved doing this. There are countless reports from Bart Schleyer's friends and colleagues that describe him as a compassionate, understanding, and unafraid person with animals. Part of the reason Schleyer was so good at researching these creatures was because he was so at home in their habitat. He made a concerted effort to spend months roughing it in mountain terrain, often carrying 80 pounds of snares and raw meat on his back, and hunting with bows and arrows that he fashioned for himself. Schleyer focused on staying in incredible shape. His co-workers on search projects report that after a hard day of labor, he would return to his camp and perform full-body workouts, often using logs as weights. One reporter for a women's magazine that was visiting Yellowstone during Schleyer's research became so enamored with him that she published an article titled The Bronze and Beautiful Heartthrob of Cook City, Montana, prompting Schleyer's co-workers to nickname him Beautiful Body Bart. All of this is to say Bart Schleyer is the last person that you would expect to go missing in the woods. In 2004, Schleyer was 49 and already widely respected in Alaska as a big game expert. Feeling trapped by civilization there, he had moved to Whitehorse, Yukon several years prior. One day that year, Schleyer was dropped off by an airplane in the Yukon wilderness. The plane dropped him off at a site called Reed Lakes with the plan of picking him up in two weeks. He was well supplied for the trip. After two weeks had passed and the plane returned to collect him, he failed to make the rendezvous. He had seemingly vanished into thin air. 
the day after he was reported missing, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police flew a search plane over Schleyer's campsite but didn't see any clues. The next day, a ground team searched the area on foot. They were able to locate Schleyer's campsite, but it appeared the hunter had only been there briefly. His tent was set up and he cooked one meal before inflating his boat and setting off on the lake. The Mounties found Schleyer's boat half a mile down the lake shore, tied off securely at both ends. Due to rapidly deteriorating weather, the team wrapped up their search effort and left. Some searchers hypothesized that he'd hiked out to the highway and left, but Schleyer's friends insisted that he would never leave his gear behind or make a drastic change of plans without calling someone to let them know. Unsatisfied with the results of the search by the Mounties, some of Schleyer's colleagues became suspicious. Dibbs Williams, a friend from Whitehorse, teamed up with the pilot Wayne Curry to fly up to Schleyer's camp at Reed Lakes and investigate for themselves. Once he arrived on site, Williams found Schleyer's tent knocked over, either by wind or animals, as well as important gear that they knew Schleyer would have taken with him if he had planned to leave. The next day, while investigating the area around Schleyer's boat, Williams and Curry found his bow resting against a tree, next to a handmade quiver of arrows and a moose collar. His pack was positioned on the ground as if he'd stopped to grab a bite to eat. An experienced moose hunter commented that this would have been a good location for an archer to set up. Not far from there, Williams found a shredded hat with Schleyer's hair on it. Thinking that a bear had snuck up behind Schleyer and surprised him while he ate, Williams called the police back in to conduct a more thorough search. Within 60 meters of Schleyer's bow, the search team found human remains with bite marks from a bear. This finding seemingly would have put the mystery of Schleyer's disappearance to rest, but several questions remain. Many members of the hunting and outdoor community that knew Schleyer believe he was simply too talented and too knowledgeable to have been taken by surprise by a bear. Many people had witnessed Schleyer escape from or subdue a charging bear and he was famous for spending as much time in the backcountry as he did in civilization. Additionally, although police found bear tracks and bone fragments and bear droppings nearby, experts are baffled by the fact that no fabric was found in the bear droppings. It's rare for a grizzly bear to try to eat a person, but in other cases where it has happened, fabric from the victim's clothes could be found in the bear's stomach. Most of Schleyer's clothes were never found, and no evidence of them appeared in nearby bear droppings. Bears are also known to bury their prey in something biologists call a cache. Investigators were not able to find any signs of a cache nearby. Even more disturbing is that the area in which the bear supposedly attacked Schleyer was totally undisturbed. Investigators didn't find any evidence of a struggle against a bear, such as broken branches or torn up moss. Schleyer's friends say that as a grizzly expert, he would have known to start off playing dead when the bear attacked. However, when he realized that that strategy wasn't working, he would have been bound to put up a fierce fight. Those who knew him are perplexed about why there are no signs of conflict. Bear attacks are known to be long and violent. Friends who investigated the scene also noted that Schleyer's ball cap was totally unharmed and his bag, which contained food, was undisturbed by the bear. If a bear had attacked him, experts think that they would have found canned food at his campsite irresistible, but the food at the camp was untouched. How Schleyer passed is still considered a mystery by some. While it's clear that a bear was likely involved, the evidence leads some experts to believe that he actually passed away before the bear ever arrived. Friends think that it's unlikely that Schleyer suffered from a sudden internal health problem, as he appeared to be in excellent shape and had just gone on several long hunts before flying to Reed Lakes. The true cause may never be known. Number 1 in 1968, Michael Larson was a normal 19-year-old boy in Madison, Wisconsin. He was a top student at his university. He'd never been in trouble with the law, and he had no girl problems, family problems, or known enemies. He wasn't facing military service, and he seemed happy. Even though he lived in the dorms, Michael had spent the past couple days at his family home. Just as Easter break was ending and classes were picking back up, he told his mother that he was stepping out for a haircut. She didn't think anything of it until she received the shocking phone call from the police 48 hours later. What Michael's mother didn't know was that when Michael left for his haircut in his green 1962 Volkswagen sedan, he withdrew $650 from his bank account, leaving it almost empty. 
He also took a poncho and a map from the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park with him. The Porcupine Mountains, located in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, are a long drive from Madison. This is where the Michigan Department of Conservation officers discovered a green 1962 Volkswagen that had mysteriously been abandoned on a remote back road near a gravel pit. The car was left unlocked and the keys in the ignition and the gas tank full. Oddly, the Wisconsin license plate had been removed and investigators found traces of blood around the front seat. They theorized that the person who removed the license plate may have simply cut their hand. The driver was nowhere to be seen and there were no clues as to his direction. Unfortunately for police, a law mandating that passenger vehicles carry vehicle identification numbers didn't go into effect until the following year. So investigators had to use oil change stickers to track down the identity of the car's owner, Michael Larson. Officers at the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park were initially confused when they tried to call Michael because the man who answered the phone claimed that while he was indeed Michael Larson, he was at home and his car was in the garage. They had accidentally contacted an officer at the Madison Police Department who was coincidentally named Michael Larson as well. After hearing about the strange abandoned vehicle, Officer Larson checked in town to see if there were any news reports of missing people. When he heard that the college student, Michael Larson, had not returned home in two days, police made the connection and they began the search. While Michael grew up as an introvert, he was also well-versed in hiking, backpacking, and science. He even built a kayak with his younger brother, Tom. Michael and Tom had once gone on a backpacking trip together to the Porcupine Mountains, the exact park where Michael disappeared years earlier. He may not have been a bushcraft expert, but Michael clearly knew basic safety skills and was familiar with the area in which he vanished. Preliminary searches turned up no results. Officials feared that Michael may have fallen down one of several mine shafts in the area, but large rescue efforts continued to be inconclusive. Eventually, the Ontonagon County Sheriff's Office sent Michael's parents a letter telling them that there was nothing more to be done. They were calling off the search. When the opening day of firearm deer hunting season arrived, however, the sheriff renewed the call to hunters to keep searching for Michael in the wilderness. Information about the disappearance was broadcast on local radio. Only a few days later, a hunter from Detroit made a horrifying discovery. Near the Lake Superior shoreline, the man saw what he thought was a boot with a branch sticking out of it. Upon closer inspection, he discovered that the branch was actually a bone. Terrified, the hunter quickly blazed a trail back to town to report what he had found. Soon after, the search resumed, and officers found a second boot nearby in a similar condition. Both boots showed clear evidence of a bear attack. Because Michael disappeared into the woods in April, just as hungry bears were emerging from hibernation, it's possible he had an unfortunate encounter with wildlife. Incidents of conflict between humans and bears are more frequent during that time of year. However, one other clue emerged. A few months later, in February of 1969, hunters stumbled upon a mysterious campsite in a remote area of the Porcupine Mountains. The seemingly abandoned camp was 10 miles from the location of the apparent bear attack. The campsite contained a tent, a canoe, and cans of food hanging from trees and plastic bags. This became an immediate source of speculation, prompting investigators to wonder if this was a secret camp that could be related to Michael's disappearance. This changed in October of that year, when a man named John Courser from Land of Lakes, Wisconsin, claimed the campsite as his own. Still, Courser's claim sparked suspicions among those close to the case, as he was unable to explain why he had waited so long to claim the site. Tom was especially intrigued by this clue, because he knew that Michael had once worked at a youth camp near Land of Lakes. It's possible that his brother and Courser knew each other. In 2022, Tom Larson found and contacted John Courser to make sure. Now 90 years old, Courser claims that he can't remember why it took him so long to claim the campsite, but that he remembers thinking when he built the camp that it would be a long time before he could return. He doesn't remember ever meeting Michael Larson. Law enforcement agencies also tried to revisit the boots in recent years, hoping to use new advancements in DNA forensics to solve the case. Agencies have searched for these pieces of evidence, but bizarrely can't find them. They can't even find records of them. According to the Michigan State Police, as of 2020, 
The National Missing and Unidentified Person System does not contain any records of the boots or bones found in the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park. With the last lead gone, the mystery remains. According to Tom, Michael's father Glenn never gave up the idea that his son was still out there. Whether they missed a call at home or answered the phone but the caller abruptly hung up, Glenn held out hope that Michael was trying to get in contact with him, wherever he was. Michael remains the only person to ever go missing in the park, but his brother Tom is continuing the search. Tom provided Michigan State Police with a sample of his DNA, and officers searched the area again with cadaver dogs. Hunters are still encouraged to search for any clothing, remains, or other evidence in the area. If anyone has any information on the disappearance of Michael Larson, they're asked to contact Michael Knack, park manager, at 906-885-5274, or John Pepin, a writer with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, at 906-226-1352. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.